much helps us with the people. So today's speaker is Itze Hinsker. I apologize for not getting the pronunciation quite right. Um, but he is Assistant Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology. All right. Um, well, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak as part of this series. Um, the basis for this invitation, I think, was uh, some software that I advertised that I advertise on my website, and so uh, that's what I will will talk about. Um, but I want to point out right away that this is just a, a, sm a small part of uh, what I do, and uh, the primary focus of my lab is to understand um, self organization in uh, human pluripotent stem cells. And uh, what that means is that, uh, on the one hand, I'm, uh, I'm actively looking for students that want to bridge the gap between experiments and theory uh, in my lab. And I'm also uh, very eager to find collaborators that are uh, purely computationally focused. Um, um, so looking, looking at some of the talks this semester, I saw a very wide range of, of subjects. So I've tried to keep things hopefully general, general enough. Um, so this talk will be about, um, you know, dealing with large live image data to understand um, developmental processes, in particular morphogenesis and patterning. And um, you know, before I build things up systematically, let me just uh, show you uh, a nice video that's getting pretty old by now, and I, I hear some people have already uh, seen it, but it still uh, demonstrates an important point, uh, which is that in, in recent years, um, microscopy has advanced to a point where we can record uh, the development of entire organisms with, with subcellular resolution uh, over, over long periods of time and with high enough time resolution that you can track individual cells throughout development. And uh, so what you see here is uh, a Drosophila fruit fly embryo that starts with, with gastrulation, um, the first um, patterning event um, that, that happens, and it develops all the way through uh, to a larva that's ready to hatch, and you, you start to see muscle contractions and everything at the end. And, um, and of course, there's, there's an incredible amount of information in uh, you know, a data set like this, uh, but the question is, how do you get that information out? What do you, what do, you do with this? Right? And um, whereas for fly embryos, um, you know, people have been able to do this for a couple of years now, and, and you know, lots have improved uh, since this video uh, was made. Uh, it's only a few months ago, uh, yeah, so here you see the end where it starts to move. It's only a few months ago that the first paper came out uh, where people did the same thing for a mouse embryo and were able to, to image an entire mouse embryo that's at, at a single cell, like subcellular resolution throughout gastrulation, so for two days. and. Um, and this is technically super impressive for, for a number of reasons, um, one of which is um, that this mouse embryo uh, changes um, size substantially over, over the course of, of this process. Um, but I will not further get into that. And uh, now that I hopefully uh, gotten you intrigued, um, I thought I would uh, you know, introduce myself in, in just a little more detail so you have some idea of where, where I'm coming from with, with some of the things I'm going to tell you about. Um, so as Marcy mentioned, I, I just started my own uh, lab in cell and developmental biology in, in October, and uh, we are focused on understanding using pluripotent uh, human stem cells as, as a model, uh, and, and with a particular focus on the relation between uh, cell signaling and cell faith and the interplay between uh, mechanics and signaling. Uh, but my formal education was actually in physics and, and computer science, and I did not start working on thinking on biology until I was postdoc. Um, so so during, my, uh, during my first postdoc, I, I worked on um, basically on modeling and analysis tools of, of uh, epithelial morphogenesis, and, and that's what I'll be talking about now. And uh, then I... Uh, did a few years of experimental work on uh, cell signaling and patterning in, in pluripotent stem cells, and so now I'm bringing these two things uh, together as a PI. Um, and the, the scientific question that, that got me uh, into biology is that of, of development. So you know, how does a, a single fertilized egg cell give rise to a, an entire precisely proportioned body consisting of many different cell types in, in all the right places? 
And then in a more recent incarnation, uh, how do pluripotent stem cells in a dish, how are they able to recapitulate some aspects of this development in a self-organized uh, manner? Um, and uh, well, of course, this, well, at least the first version of that question people have been working on for uh, hundreds of years. And uh, geneticists have produced, at least for some important developmental processes, a fairly complete list of the genes that are involved and uh, some of their, their interactions. Um, but it's still very poorly understood how these genes are regulated in space and time to give rise to precise uh, patterns and, and shapes. And, uh, and to obtain such a, a quantitative <coughs> systems level understanding of, of development that, that I'm aiming for, requires um, high quality quantitative data. Um, so for example, if you want to understand tissue shape change, um, well, in, 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 in general, sort of the, the question is how do you relate behavior of individual cells to behavior of a tissue or the organism as a whole? Right? How do you bridge these scales so you, you can understand the collective behavior? And uh, if, you, if you look at morphogenesis, so the tissue shape change, right, um, and you want to understand how this comes about in terms of the behavior of the individual cells, um, you want to be able to measure the growth of individual cells, their division. You want to see rearrangements between neighbors. Um, and, uh, and aside from those geometric aspects, you may want to uh, locally measure things like forces that, that lead to movement. Um, and what that means is that you, know, you need um, very high resolution um, images like this, where you, you can see the precise geometry and neighbor relations between cells and with high enough time resolution that you can track how these neighbor relations change uh, during development. And then you want to record you know, at this resolution for an entire organ or an entire um, uh, embryo. Um, so here you see a Drosophila uh, X chamber so that you can relate right, the local behavior of these cells to the overall shape changes of, of the tissue. And, um, and on the patterning side of, of things, you basically right, you got spatial domains um, of different cell fates. So this is the, the system I'm primarily working with. Now these are, the, these are spatially patterned uh, human embryonic stem cells. Uh, and you see different cell fates visualized. And, uh, and basically, the, there's a similar challenge in that um, we want to measure um, nuclear levels of, of different signaling proteins in individual cells uh, over time to understand how 6,000 cells together form this, this very precise spatial pattern, right? And so in both cases, and, 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 and in, in both cases, you want to track individual cells through this process, so you need, um, you need to record you know, entire um, very large structures at very high resolution, both in space and time. And uh, so, you know, the amazing thing is that, um, right, here's a little bit of a video of cell signaling. Um, the amazing thing is that, you know, we can actually do this. Um, but one of the challenges is that, that data volumes quickly get large. So um, for the light sheet video of, of Drosophila development that I showed, um, it takes, uh, well, if you just look at gastrulation, which is just the beginning of that video, it takes about two hours, um, but you take 100 Z slices every 30 seconds with multiple cameras um, from multiple directions. And, uh, and so it comes down to um, six gigabytes per minute and about 720 gigabytes for a single video. And then, um, although the time scales are very different for um, you know, the stem cell, model that I showed, the total volume has come out about the same. So uh, you want to follow a couple colonies over, uh, over the pattern formation process, which takes two days um, for that particular case. Um, and with you know, a couple minutes time resolution, which is enough to, to track the cells, um, then two days of, of this also comes in the couple hundred gigabit range. And so Basically, if you, if you try to get this kind of data, each experiment comes in, in the range of, of, of about a terabyte of data, and um, right, it, it, takes a, it takes less than a week to fill up a typical hard drive 
and so how do you how do you keep working with with volumes of data like that? Um, so um, so that's that's the technical question, and and for the remainder of my talk, um, I'm going to spend a big chunk talking about one particular solution I developed uh, for a specific case, which is called tissue cartography, and and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, vertex. Uh, vertex model tools um, as a way to, to condense information in, in image data sets and, and also as a framework for mathematical modeling of the underlying uh, mechanisms. <clears throat> so so the, the, the tissue cartography um, part that I'm going to discuss now is, uh, is based on the Nature uh, Methods paper. 2015. Um, so, so as I said, um, and you see, I, I switched the styles between black and white slides uh, at some point a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, so, um, um, yeah, as I said, it's 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 a challenge to work with with large volumes of data, uh, but also if you if you record entire organs or organisms, there there are additional challenges that basically have to do with imaging a complex three-dimensional structure um, and, uh, and and 3D analysis being hard. So um, if you have a membrane labeled um, uh, embryo and you want to understand, you, you know, you want to see which cells are neighbors, um, it's very difficult <coughs> to segment membranes faithfully in 3D and very costly. Um, but you know, simple projections onto 2D, like a maximal intensity projection, um, lead to, to very messy pictures that uh, that you cannot cannot work with. And uh, and so basically, uh, right, you need to do need to do something else. Um, or 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 you know, the, the difficulty of the problem just gets out of out of control. Um, but luckily, it's it's not completely hopeless because um, in in this case and and in many other cases, and I'll give you a whole range of examples. Uh, everything that we're interested in is happening in, in actually a very small fraction of the total volume that's being recorded, um, because the early fly embryo, all the cells are sitting in a in a single layer on the surface of the egg, right? and so. Um, you know, rather than a region of interest, there is a surface of interest, and uh, and outside that surface of interest, you know, 99% of the boxes being recorded <coughs> don't contain anything we want to know. Right? And so, first of all, if you could just isolate the information on that surface, the data would become very manageable, even small. And uh, the second thing is that you know this problem is quite a bit like um, dealing with the surface of Earth and describing it. Right? And uh, and so the analysis can be approached in much the same way. Um, right. So when we want to describe something happening on the surface of Earth, what we do is we make maps. Um, and maps I will try to consistently call charts from here on out because uh, map also has a more general definition that gets confusing. And uh, and the simplest way to make a map of something sphere like is to project it onto a, onto a cylinder. So here's the example, Earth. And so you can do the same thing for a fly embryo, which you see here. And now you get a very clean two-dimensional image that's, that's easy to segment. Um, but you know, you're probably also aware of the shortcomings of, of these charts, uh, which is that um, Well, to, to um, turn a sphere into a square, they have different topology, so you have to cut it somewhere. So you're introducing artificial edges. And uh, because the geometry is different, you inevitably get distortion. And uh, and depending on your choice of map, that distortion will end up in one place or another. Uh, but in typical maps of Earth, right, the, the north and south pole are heavily distorted. Similarly, in this projection of a fly embryo onto a cylinder, the anterior and posterior poles are very distorted. And so when you have cells that enter the polar regions, you lose them. And if you have cells that move across cut, um, well, you could 
go to pick them up on the other side, but it's tricky bookkeeping. Um, oh, no, it's, it's the same video here. So yeah, you can actually see this, this map as a video. And uh, well, you see, this is a pole that separates off the head. So Kuro, and here on the ventral side, um, the, the mesoderm moves in. Uh, and, and here, the gut tube is starting to form from the posterior. Um, so, um, so the solution. Um, this uh, this problem is uh, is to make more than one one chart to make a number of overlapping charts that have their cuts and distortion in different places so that you know every location you're interested in is uh, is is um, sort of easy to, to look at in at least one of the maps and uh, and so here's and, and a collection of charts is called an atlas. And here you see an example of an atlas of the fly embryo. Um, so now there are two, um, two maps or two charts that cover the anterior and posterior pole in a way that there's um, minimal distortion right at the poles and that overlap a little bit um, that way. And then there's the cylindrical um, map uh, that I showed you before. And now you can start to segment and track cells and pick them up in different um, in different maps um, and follow them across cuts. Look here. Um, but that's not completely trivial. Um, um, and yeah. And again, before before I get further into that, let me show you a video version of of the atlas. So now you see this gastrulation of the fly embryo again, and once in a, in a cylindrical projection, and once in a chart that centers around the posterior pole. So it's the exact same data in, a, in two different ways, but the cells that here move along the posterior pole from the ventral to the dorsal side that are impossible to follow here are actually relatively easy to follow here. But um, like I said, it's it's not completely trivial to actually work with multiple charts um, like that, because if you want to pick up a cell in uh, that leaves one chart and you want to pick it up in, a, in another, um, you have to have to keep very careful track uh, of the relations between your different different charts. Right? So you need to construct transition maps from the coordinates. That you use to to make your make your charts, uh, so that you can precisely map locations in one onto the other and match up your cell segmentations in, in each. And then right, you have to do some pitching to come up with a way uh, to uh, if you if you have you know segmentation errors in one or the other, how to resolve them. But as far as the transition between the two goes, it's basically just uh, just you know, doing the math, right? And uh, um, you know, depending on the audience, some people think that this is <laughs> um, completely new math, but it's it's right. It's standard differential geometry that every mathematician or theoretical physicist uh, learns, and uh, and all we did was apply it to this uh, this image analysis uh, problem. And then um, as you can start to man. The individual cells and follow them um, like this. Um, so dealing with the transitions is not the only thing that requires carefully doing the math, because as I said, there's distortion, and, and although the choice of, of chart can sort of minimize the distortion in some region, uh, there's always some. And so if you want to measure anything, Geometrical, like the length of the track, the area of the cell, the velocity by with which a cell is moving, 
you cannot naively measure it in the two-dimensional images that you're working with. Um, but um, again, in, in constructing um, in constructing these these charts, that you introduce a, a coordinate system on the surface. I'll explain it a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. And uh, and if you carefully keep track of that, and you can you can calculate a structure called the metric tensor. And uh, and if you if you use that right, you can uh, faithfully measure all geometric quantities in any chart. Um, you know, um, and, and correct for for distortion, and so that's that's demonstrated here. So um, if you take these tracks, um, they can have quite different length from their true length. Uh, if you measure just you know the naive length in the two dimensional image, there's uncorrected versus you know correctly <laughs> measured, and you can also get completely different answers in, in different charts. Um, but if you if you use at the, the proper way of measuring things with, with the metric tensor, you get the right answer every time. And um, and so basically, um, you know, what we did is um, build a MATLAB toolbox that um, deals with this in general, um, where once you define a surface in some image data set, it creates an atlas and it has built in um, you know, the other functions that correctly measure these geometrical quantities on the charts in the atlas. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it's in a, in a Nature Methods paper from a couple of years ago, and the code is is on the, on GitHub. And uh, you know, with with that tool in hand, you can then start to do things like this, where you make a map of cell areas across an entire embryo. And you can start to pick up on spatial patterns in, in cell area. And uh, so this is yet another kind of chart again. It's related to the cylindrical one. Uh, but then, uh, you know, the coordinate in the, uh, well, let's say y direction is, is uh, different to, to minimize the distortion near the pole as much as possible. And, uh, and uh, well, I should say that. Uh, as you can see that this was not, the information in the poll was not corrected by the segmentation from other charts, which is why there's a lot of errors uh, right near the, near the poles here. Um, but the error rate in this you know, center part is very low, so you get a, and, and, and you, you can really look at all thousands of cells in the embryo simultaneously like this in a, in a very easy way. Uh, this was a video tool, but I'll skip over it. Um, so, um, yeah, in a way, that's convenience of analysis and visualization. But getting back to the problem that I started with, uh, it will not surprise you that um, if you reduce this three-dimensional data set to a two-dimensional data set that corresponds to a small fraction of the volume, is that the size of your data goes down by, by orders of magnitude, so typically 10 to 100 times, and that you get a corresponding improvement in performance uh, when, when analyzing it. And, uh, and that has a lot of practical value. Um, because, I mean, some people just say, oh, whatever, terabytes, we have fast, <laughs> fast network here, fast computers, it's fine. But, um, when we, if, you, if you're collaborating long distance, for example, it's not so easy. So uh, when we started this project, we were getting the raw data from Germany, and it would take a couple days, days to, to transfer the data for one experiment. Uh, but the moment that the pre-processing and reducing it to an atlas of two-dimensional videos was done there, it would take 10 minutes to get an experiment from Germany to you know, our lab in Santa Barbara at the time. Um, so there's a lot to say for that approach. <laughs> um, okay, so so you know, I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about how it works. Um, again, oh, and, and feel free to interrupt me with questions because again, I'm not super sure about <laughs> the audience, and uh, and so to some um, audiences it seems completely obvious how this works, and and to others it seems like black magic. Um, 
But basically, right, there are three steps to the, to the process. Um, the first is um, that you identify your surface of interest. Second is, um, and, and you turn that into some sort of you know, representation, uh, abstract representation of, of the surface. Then you chop it into, into regions, overlapping regions that you parameterize. So you put surface coordinates on it. So you can think, you know, if it, if it was Earth, longitude and latitude. And then creating the two dimensional charts is basically make a square grid of these surface coordinates. So say grid of longitude and latitude, and then interpolate the intensities from the three dimensional image on that square grid of longitude and latitude. And that's I get the two-dimensional images, right? So um, clearly, the the surface detection is 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 the most sensitive to the specifics of the problem, um, and and so it's you know it's the input to the to the toolbox that you have to uh, have to do something with yourself, really specific specific to your problem, but it, it's it's standard image segmentation, and so there's a wide range of strategies to do this, um, like you know, edge detection, active contours. Um, and there is, in fact, a, a, a near universal uh, solution for it, um, which is, um, well, the tool I usually use is Elastic, which is a machine learning uh, tool that classifies pixels. And so um, you can very easily train it to identify tish, you know, embryo versus non-embryo and create a binary mask of your embryo, and uh, and this works very well on downsampled data, so you don't have to like, train it on um, very large images, which is computationally expensive. And then you can just take the surfaces of your binary image um, as the surface of of, um, of interest, and you know you can propagate them up or down with the normal vectors if you want to be somewhere in the middle, things like that. And, uh, and, and you know, you see this works pretty well. This is a, a pretty complex uh, shape. This is a, an uh, E8.5 mouse embryo. And, uh, you know, here is, for example, the amnion, so one of the protective membranes around the embryo that's, that's forming. And, uh, and it picked it up uh, fine. Um, and then, you know, when you have a, a binary image, you can turn it into a, a cloud of surface points. And uh, and then use that as input to generate a smooth mesh that connects these points. So then you have a mesh representation of, of your surface. And then there are many tools out there to equip meshes with with different coordinate sets, and it's also easy to sort of develop ways of, of putting um, surface coordinates on, on vertices on a, on a mesh yourself. And then, as I, as I said. I to turn it into a into a 2D image. Um, all you have to do is, is interpolate the original image data um, on a square grid of your of your mesh coordinates for a particular region. So that's how it works. Um, and now I'm just going to give you you know a couple of, a couple of examples of what you can do with that. Um, so the first example, this is a, a Drosophila wing disc. Um, so it's an, uh, an organ in the Drosophila larva that's going to form the wing uh, during metamorphosis. And uh, it consists of um, two epithelial layers, one that's very um, squamous, so, so big flat cells, and then uh, a columnar, so tall and and, and narrow cells underneath. And normally it's it's almost impossible to separate these two layers because they're you know they're juxtaposed and um, in a max and, and and you know they're not flat enough that they align with the Z slices of the microscope. And so in a maximal intensity projection you'll just get both. And if you want to measure cell areas and shapes, it'll uh, right the the famous Cells will throw you off from getting the right segmentation of the columnar layer, and uh, and just getting the squamous cells out themselves is is not doable um, unless unless you do something special, which <laughs> um, which is 
try to detect these surfaces of interest. And uh, and so that's that's not uh, that's that's doable. So here you see a, a surface of interest in a, in a side view of the C stack running one running through the kilometer cells, which so the thing that's being labeled um, here is this ecaferin, which is only on the apical side of the cells. So these columnar cells extend down. You only see like the membrane on the apical lateral side labeled. This road goes through the, the, the columnar cells. And then here you see a surface of interest going through the peripodial cells. And now you can make a map, which is very simple here because you can just use standard XY grid that, that the line there is to begin with and, and get a clean image of each of these tissue layers. Um, separate them like this, and you could even map them back in different different colors and, and uh, sort of get virtual virtual tissue markers. Um, so in a similar example of, of separating different tissues, but in a more three-dimensional setting, um, this is a Drosophila uh, egg chamber. So it's making uh, the egg. It's part of the ovary. And uh, so what you have is is an outer layer of monolayer of cells, the follicular epithelium, that surrounds nurse cells in the oocyte that are forming the egg. And if you, again, if you look at a maximal intensity projection, it's a complete mess because it's a complex three dimensional structure, but it's very easy to detect the outside of the egg chamber and then uh, make um, a map of the cell shapes of the, in the follicular epithelium like this, um, and then analyze right, the, the cell morphologies and, and things like that uh, straight, in a straightforward way. Um, so another example that's, that's um, similar but more challenging again is, uh, this is a mouse embryo just after gastrulation. Um, and so uh, this is three layers here, the, the endoderm on the outside, which will form the future gut. There's mesoderm, which will form muscle and bone. And the inner layer is the ectoderm, which will form skin and, uh, and the nervous system. And uh, it's very dense and, and hard to image through. Um, but on the outside, at least, on the endoderm, the image quality is high, and you can extract the surface of the mouse embryo, make a cylindrical projection or a projection around uh, the distal pole, use that to segment the individual nuclei, and then also map them back to the original three-dimensional surface again, and, uh, and so get measurements of uh, things like cell density uh, in, uh, in the endoderm of the developing mouse embryo that way. Um, yeah, of course you could attempt to do this with purely three-dimensional image analysis, and you know sometimes that's that's a good approach, um, but uh, it's it's hard to right. It's, it's making use of the of the known structure of the sample uh, makes makes things a lot easier uh, to interpret and, and see that that it's working. Um, and then this is this is a final example, which is by far the most complex. Um, um, was really just to show show off that this this works quite generally, uh, which is a beating embryonic zebrafish heart. So this is a very complex shape that rapidly changes in time. Um, so one of the challenges is how do you map shapes, different shapes at different times, to each other to have a continuous um, map or continuous uh, video. And, uh, and then, um, well, the other thing is that <clears throat> the, the more complex the shape is, the more curvature you have, the more distortion you're going to have when you map it to, to a square or a circle. And so if you want to have you know, um, charts with, with not insane amounts of distortion, it means you're going to have to chop up the surface into more and more separate regions. But you know, other than that, you can just do it. And uh, and then here you see the kind of thing uh, 
you know, one application of that, which is you can follow them individual nuclei on the surface of this beating heart. So these are snapshots. I don't think I included the video here. And then use this, this you know, metric corrective measurement, measure the area spanned by these nuclei, and make a plot of the local uh, area deformation um, on, in, the, in that part of the heart. So that's uh, you know that's as much as I, uh, I was going to tell you about tissue cartography. So just to summarize, right? So when you do in total live imaging, it produces huge data volumes. Uh, but for, for in many cases, right, there is a curved surface of interest that occupies only a small uh, fraction of, of the volume you're recording, and this can be effectively visualized and analyzed using cartography. Um, and this actually raises an, an, an interesting question about what we should, should consider uh, raw data. Um, and so NIH <coughs> requires that you hold on to raw data for at least three years after completion of a project. Project can take five years. It means you might have to hold on to raw data for eight years. Now, if you're collecting a couple terabytes a week for a project, that means you're talking about petabyte range image data. And it just that's just insane. Uh, at this time. And, uh, you know, nobody complains about the fact that you defined a region of interest when you were recording and there was stuff happening in the room outside, <laughs> you know, that, that's not recorded. Um, you know, so why should we be required to hold on to the entire volume we recorded and, and actually not consider, um, you know, these two-dimensional atlases of videos? Uh, the relevant raw data and exclude all those pixels where stuff is happening that we're not not interested in. Um, and uh, you know, similar things are happening in other settings. Um, for Illumina sequencing, you don't hold on to the raw Im imaging data. And uh, in CERN, uh, where they're recording you know particles flying through a detector, they, they throw out most of the data in real time. Um, but it's just that you know, in, in developmental biology and microscopy, it's just hitting a point where the data is getting so big that this problem has never been dealt with and, and, and the rules have not been adapted to that yet. Okay, so, um, you know, in, in the time I have left, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about now you have a video with, of, of your tissue that you can segment, um, then what can you do with it to, to learn about development about morphogenesis patterning. And I'm going to keep this uh, you know, very superficial. Um, I mostly want to talk about it for a few minutes as a conversation starter with, with anyone that would be interested in also working on it. <clears throat> um, so um, one way that you can uh, represent what uh, an epithelial monolayer uh, looks like. If one way one way to represent it in a simplified way is is uh, using a, a vertex representation. So basically, turning it into a into a mesh uh, where the where the vertices are the actual vertices between between cells, and uh, the interfaces between cells are are represented as, as straight lines. Um, as you can see from this image, where you can barely see. <laughs> The membrane labeling underneath. Sometimes that is a very good approximation. Sometimes it's not as good of an approximation. Um, but in this way, um, right, you at least capture the topology of the tissue, so the neighbor relations between the cells accurately and in a simple way. And then um, if you want to understand cell rearrangement and, and division and how it contributes to the overall deformation of the tissue, that becomes uh, straightforward. And um, by, by keeping track of the vertex positions, um, to have some approximation of the, the geometry of each cell. So, and uh, you can measure local deformation rates, strain rates of both individual cells and the tissue overall. Um, and then um, often, actually, it's also, uh, you also want to keep track of where the nucleus, where the center of the nucleus is. And, uh, and, and by 
um, you know, keeping track of nuclear positions and the nearest neighbors. Uh, the nuclear lattice as well, you're basically defining a dual graph to the graph that's defined by the primary <coughs> vertex representation of the, of the tissue, um, which is a useful property that you sometimes make use of. Um, and uh, yeah, and so there's a lot you can do to understand overall tissue deformation with this, but if you want to look at patterning, um, this kind of coarse-grained representation of, of a, a layer of cells is, is also very useful um, because generally, um, you know, if you want to measure protein intensities, you're interested in them uh, in overall intensities in some specific compartment, at least for the problems I, I work on. I know there are other problems. Uh, for example, you want to know the overall level of a signaling protein in the nucleus or the overall uh, level of some junctional protein on a particular cell cell interface. And, uh, <clears throat> and so you, you can basically um, assign all these coarse grain properties to either edges in your, in your vertex representation or, or vertices, either on the primary or the dual, dual lattice, and, and have sort of a simple data structure that keeps track of, of you know, all these coarse grain features of your tissue in, a, in an efficient way, and, uh, <clears throat> and use that to, to analyze things you're interested in. Um, so just to, you know, it's, it's a bit abstract like that, so just to give you a, a concrete example, um, here's, here's a project where um, we were interested in um, cell polarity arising from heterodimers between two proteins um, that are on the membrane and uh, or, or also expressed on the membrane, so they're labeled in red and green. And, uh, and uh, these form heterodimers um, on the cell interfaces where, where cells expressing the red or the green protein uh, touch. And, uh, and so basically there was a vertex, I made a vertex model representation of these, of these cells, assigned the overall level of, of heterodimers, like as a measure yellow, to, to particular interfaces, and uh, measured an overall level of red or green in each cell. And from that, I could extract a quantitative relation between the red and green levels in cells and uh, the probability of, uh, of forming heterodimers on the interface between those cells. And we were able to identify that, that there are concentration thresholds, or, or at least level thresholds um, in, this, in this relationship. Um, so it's, it's a nice way to start to, um, you know, handle the, the data you can get out. Um, but this vertex representation is also very natural if you want to write down mathematical models to understand the underlying mechanisms of what you're looking at. Um, but by discretizing into, in, into cells, which are the, the natural units that, that, you know, in real life discretize the tissue, uh, <clears throat> It's easy to, to incorporate you know, proliferation and cell rearrangement in your, in your model. It's easy to interpret the results biologically, and it's also easy to link to sort of ODE models of, of you know, the internal workings of the cell for, for signaling and gene regulation. And, and this is in contrast to you know, modeling frameworks where you define the cell as some spatial domain in a continuum, like a POTS model or something. So the simplest example give of a model like that is, um, is a purely mechanical one where you just say each cell has a pressure and um, each interface has a tension and, uh, and you keep track of the coordinates of each vertex right? and then you can write down an energy that governs the behavior of this, this uh, epithelium um, right, in terms of the, the area uh, and the length of each interface. Um, and now you can add, you know, whatever complex behavior you want to this. So, right, cells. So this this thing, right, you can derive the continuum limit it behaves us as an elastic material. Um, but cells are, are very different from you know, elastic materials in that they can actively respond to their environment and regulate their mechanical properties. And these kind of feedbacks you can easily incorporate in this model and start simulating different scenarios. And and so here you see. Um, application of that. 
Oh. This is a video. Oh, it already played. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is a simulation um, of a locally overgrowing clone in a tissue. And uh, what's visualized on one side are the, uh, the tensions on each edge. What's visualized there are the pressures inside each cell. And this model incorporates a feedback where the tension on edges is downregulated when the pressure increases so that the cell minimizes its deformation. And, uh, and, and that's why the tensions inside an overgrowing flow can go down. And uh, you know, this sim simulation explained some uh, features we experimentally observe of, of overgrowing clones in uh, the Drosophila wing disk, of which I showed you some images earlier. So this is almost my last slide. Uh, another thing you can do, rather than you know putting in some parameters for some model for your tissue and, and seeing what happens in a simulation, um, you can, and, and that basically predicts the geometry of your tissue at different times, you can also try to solve the inverse problem and uh, use the geometry of your cells <coughs> as input and try to infer the parameters of your model. Um, and if you um, take that simple mechanical model that I had two slides ago, and you say there's a tension on each interface and a pressure in each cell, and you assume that the cells are close to mechanical equilibrium, then you can actually solve this inverse model, and you can predict tensions on each cell interface and pressures in each cell. Now, of course, if you have a well-defined mathematical problem, you know, you can always produce numbers, and maybe what comes out is complete nonsense. Um, but in this case, you can actually verify that in various ways. And, um, and for example, you can look at, if you have a myosin label, uh, myosin is the molecular motor that generates tension on interfaces. And, uh, and you can look at the correlation between predicted tension from geometry and the intensity of, of myosin on the interface. And uh, into the most recent incarnation of this method, because uh, there, you know, there certainly there's some subtleties in how sensitive it is to noise, and there are different ways to get around it. Uh, but the most recent version, there's up to 80% <coughs> correlation between uh, myosin levels on, uh, on interfaces and predicted tensions. Which, on the one hand, it's surprising that you can explain that much of the tension with just myosin levels, because the activity uh, is not just captured by, by levels. Um, but on the other hand, it really indicates that uh, the inference from images can, can be very accurate and very powerful. And, uh, and so this is, this is I'm, I'm just going to end then with a future direction. So, so one of the, the questions I've been wondering about is, um, you know, that there's a, you know, a mechanistic model for the mechanics of the tissue underlying this. Um, but could we not do the same thing with a purely statistical model? Train some classifier on, to, to, to predict myosin levels on edges and see if it does as well or maybe even better. And if, if that works, you know, could we not predict many other features um, of tissues that are hard to measure? Uh, for example, cell fate. So when cells differentiate, it also affects their morphology and, uh, and maybe their coarse grain representations of, 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 of the tissue where we can actually predict the pattern of sulfates in cases where we cannot measure it by directly visualizing the relevant transcription factors. Um, so I'd be very interested in uh, talking to anyone else that you know would would like to think about this this problem. And uh, well, that's it. So questions. Yeah. <laughs> Is, uh, back in the cartography part of the talk, I, yeah. I may have missed this, but when you're putting the coordinate system onto the, the uh, structure, is that taking into account the, the actual biology so that if you want to compare across samples, everything's in the same coordinate system? Uh, so matching up different samples is, is a challenge okay. in itself. So, I mean, I mean, it just adds another level on top, right? So, you would you would create a map or a, or, or you know a chart of 
of two embryos, if you want to match them up and, and they have slightly different shapes, then uh, your image should actually label landmarks. And then you can try to adjust your coordinate system with those landmarks. But then it has to be iterative because to identify the landmarks, you have to make the chart first, unless you are going to do 3D image analysis, which is the point was to avoid that. Right? So just to, to illustrate that, uh, OK. So maybe, um, you know, if we, if we want to look at average properties of multiple fly embryos, we want to, we want to align this uh, like furrow that defines where the head and the body are separated. So then we have to first make this, then segment up this line, then construct a new coordinate system based on this, maybe lines that you know, are locally substantial to, to this, and then use that to register the, the resulting. Well, the, the multiple fly embryos. So something that happens somewhat often during development is cell death. Yeah. Um, can you tell the difference between a cell dying and just going below the surface? You know, when you look, if you don't know anything about development, when you look at like just the video you just showed, right? it's almost like cells are disappearing, which, you know, we know from what we know about morphogenesis here that they're moving below the surface, but there are other times where they're actually dying. Yeah. So I mean, your the essence of your question is things are not truly to be <laughs> right. right. Um, and uh, and so you can deal with that with this uh, this approach by basically uh, making an onion. Right. So you take um, and you you take your surface that and then you propagate it in along the normal vector, and you just make a collection of surfaces of which you make you know, your two-dimensional charts. And then you could do things like see a cell that disappears in one layer, see it appear in another. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a point at which you know, approximating things as 2B is just not a reasonable approach anymore, so that you have to determine on a case-by-case on a -case basis. There are some morphological changes that you know occur during apoptosis. Yeah, you may be able to see it and like be able to differentiate between the two without having to go back to multiple surfaces. And, yeah. Well, so so you can you can definitely make and, and I haven't. Um, well, I should have included it in the talk, I guess. Uh, make like a virtual Z stack where you have you know, these cylinder maps from the apical through the basal surface. But you can just look at it as if it's it was a flattened tissue to begin with. And then you know you can you can see things like um, um, during the vision, like um, the spindle moves to the apical surface and, and expands there and then it goes down again, like the nucleus goes down again afterwards. So, um, in, in, a, in a more straightforward way than you would in these cross sections. Any other questions? Thank you. All right.